In my other talk, I talked about the history of corn, the domestication process from teosinte to maize. That took about 9,000 years. And now I want to talk about what's happened in the last hundred or so years, where sort of the process of evolution has sped up due to scientific breeding. This is a picture of the U.S. average national grain yields over the last hundred or so years. And you can see that the grain yields were pretty flat until about 1945. That was the period when people were growing the so-called open pollinated or heritage type varieties, saving their own seed. And with the development of F1 hybrids that I talked about in the other talk, the farmers started buying their seed, their F1 seed from the commercial seed companies because they had the advantage of higher yield. Now, genetics is not the only reason the yields have gone up between 1945 and today. Part of the increase is also due to application of more nitrogen fertilizer, more pesticides, uh, me mechanization, improved agronomic methods. But about half of this increase, at least half of this increase, has been due to genetics. And a lot of that is due to the development of hybrid maize. So you can see in 1940, I've got that arrow that shows that about 50% of the corn acreage was planted to F1 hybrid varieties. And by 1960, it's 99%. So the yields have kept going up because companies have developed a lot of re research or resources into developing new, improved hybrids, and the farmers buy them year after year. And what the farmers are no longer doing is saving their seed. So what has happened to those old heritage varieties? What has happened to that genetic diversity? Much of the genetic diversity has been lost in terms of what farmers are actually planting. So all these new hybrids that cover something like 80 million acres of corn in the U.S. every year are actually all very closely related to each other. Sort of like one breed of dog out of the many hundreds of breeds that are available. So what has happened to the old varieties? Well, as hybrids came along and were replacing the open pollinated varieties, some scientists recognized this was happening and realized the implications for, for genetic diversity in the species. And they began systematically collecting the open pollinated varieties, not just in the US, but all through the Americas. So from Chile all the way to Canada, essentially seed saving expedition teams went to farms, collected all these different varieties, classified them according to the type of corns they were, and these have been stored in seed banks. This is a picture of a seed bank at the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement. And this is in Mexico City, near Mexico City. And they have, I think, 20,000 or so unique populations of corn, most of them the old varieties. The USDA in the USA also maintains a seed bank that similarly has many thousands of collections of, of the old open pollinated varieties. So they're available for use by scientists and breeders. One concern has been that we rely on these seed banks and in some of the seed banks in some countries essentially have lost their collections because they were not well maintained, the power supply was not adequate. You have to keep these things cold and at low humidity. And, if, and seeds are living organisms and they will eventually die. So you have to keep them under uh, well-maintained, low humidity, cold conditions. That prompted the development of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is also called the Doomsday Backup, for all these seed bank collections. This is in the Arctic Circle in Norway, and this holds seed samples from essentially all the public collections of all the crops and is considered as the backup. So if collections are lost at these working um, seed banks, we will have collections for the future maintained here in Svalbard. One thing we, we've been working on at NC State, and actually this started long before I started working here, goes back, you can see here in the 1950s, is to recognize that the hybrids grown commercially in the U.S. are a very narrow sample of the genetic variation that's available in the species. And we have good reason to believe, we have good evidence, that there's really useful genes for disease resistance and e even for productivity and yield 
in the types of corn that are grown in other parts of the world and in some of these old populations. Now, they're not maintained by farmers anywhere, so we have, as researchers, we have to go to the seed banks, request seed samples, and evaluate them. One problem with evaluating tropical corns, which is the corns that come from most of the Latin American countries and actually represent most of the genetic diversity, is that they don't flower at an appropriate time here in North Carolina. They grow vegetatively, very, very tall. They grow really tall, and they often don't flower until almost the end of the season. It's because they're waiting for shorter day lengths than we have in the summer. So this is what's called photoperiod sensitivity, and we've done a lot of work to try to understand the genetics of this and to use that information to overcome the barriers between tropical and temperate corn. And one thing in addition to commercial corn used to feed pigs and make ethanol and things like that is to recognize that something that has been lost to some extent also in this country is not just the genetic diversity but the food culture that's gone along with it. If you go to Mexico today, that's one thing Mexico has maintained is not only their genetic diversity of corn but also the food culture of corn. Food's the staple crop in Mexico and used in thousands of different ways for different kinds of foods. So here's just a picture of some examples. You know, you know tortillas, but do you know about pozole? Do you know about uh, the fact that they have what they call elote corn? It's like sweet corn, but it's not sweet corn. It's just regular corn that's eaten fresh, typically roasted, and it can be quite delicious. Atole is a beautiful drink made from corn. You know about tamales. Um, but in the U.S., the food corn culture really is most recognized in terms of grits and cornbread. And believe it or not, there is a movement um, these days to kind of reclaim that food culture, which is to say, are there differences in grits made from different varieties? And you'll have chefs who will tell you, oh, there's, there can be quite big differences in the culinary value of different corn types. So they're very interested and having farmers start growing some of these older varieties that have you know, better food properties. And you can see, here's some pictures of old corn variety that produces these apparently really good tasting grits that can be sold for a pretty good price. So it actually makes money for the farmers. It's new markets for the farmers. It's new opportunities for chefs to explore these traditions. And of course, there's things like whiskey. Um, there's varieties that make better whiskey than others, apparently. So one research avenue we're following up is trying to evaluate all these different corns for these different uses, and also to think about the cultural importance of corn. So the indigenous tribal groups of North Carolina and South Carolina, they basically had lost their corn culture for many reasons, but much of the culture was really demolished by colonization. And now there's an effort to reclaim important aspects of the culture. And one of those aspects is the heritage varieties that uh, these peoples developed. And by going into the seed banks, we can identify these are varieties that were grown in this area, you know, probably from the, at least from the 1600s to the 1900s. And these are probably, uh, descendants of the ancestral corns of these tribal groups. And so we're working with some of these tribal groups to have them rematriate or reclaim some of these varieties for their important cultural uses.